Hello. Good evening. If we could take our assigned spots. Assigned by whom? I have no idea, but we could just get that. Okay, so good evening. It is my great pleasure to see so many people in the audience, um, interested minds, and in the material we'll be speaking about tonight. This event is hosted by the Community Mental Health Program here at CIIS, um, and also by um, the NASIS Retreat Center. So um, I'm actually going to start with that real quick. So people will ask, okay, well, what is the NASIS Retreat Center? So the NASIS Retreat Center is um, uh, something that's trying to be established in the Bay Area that would help people in a, in a way that the Artie Lane houses, to call it that, that back in the day, would be here in the Bay Area and be able to work with people in extreme states. So if you're interested in that, please um, come and speak with Michael directly, or James, who's sitting right up here, right? Two main people are involved with it. Um, they do really good work. Um, and there's talks that are put on um, and uh, salons. So it's a really groovy outfit that they have going on. So, all right. Um, so tonight's talk is titled The Enigma of Happiness and Why It is So Elusive. Um, and this is being, uh, the text is being given by Michael Guy Thompson. So now, who is this Michael Guy Thompson? So he's sitting up here in the front. Let me say a few words about him. He is a personal and supervising analyst and faculty member at um, PINK, the Psychoanalytic Institute of Northern California, and president of Free Association Incorporated. He's the author of numerous books, journal articles, and reviews on psychoanalysis, phenomenology, and schizophrenia, and is the director of the Gnosis Retreat Center. His most recent book is The Death of Desire, an Existential Study in San Sanity and Madness, and it's published by Rutledge. He is currently completing a new book, The Enigma of Happiness, which is what he's drawn from for this talk. Now, of course, that's the official bio. The other thing is Michael Beck Thompson's just a really cool dude. So, and a good friend. So if you could uh, join me in welcoming Michael Beck Thompson. Thanks, Fernando. Could everybody hear me okay? Um, so I really want to thank Fernando for inviting me to do this talk this evening and also all the great work that Brittany did to put this event together. And of course, my colleague, uh, James Norwood. So I've been uh, thinking about this topic of happiness for over 30 years as something that I uh, would love to write about someday. And the reason for that was because uh, when I was a young man, uh, thinking about going to work with R.D. Lang in, in London, I was very unhappy. And, um, and it was a bit of a mystery to me how, how a person finds this in their life. So I set out to try and start studying the history of the concept. Um, so now, 30, almost 40 years later, I think I'm ready to start getting to it <laughs> and share some of the thoughts that I've derived about this. I know I, I exhaustive. Uh, so my talk tonight is, uh, is a bit of a sample from the book that I'm working on, uh, but I think it does kind of lay out some of the questions I wanted to raise and uh, try to get a little bit of insight into. So. Uh, this will take about 40 minutes or so, and then uh, Fernando and I will um, have a little discussion on stage, and we'll open it up to all of you to participate and hopefully uh, enlighten us with your wonderful thoughts about this topic. So, what does it take to be happy? How can we characterize what it means to live a happy, and contented life. What's more, how do you know when you're happy? What criteria do we employ when we try to determine whether we're on the right track? That we're conducting our life in such a way 
that suggest we're living it to the fullest, that we're leaving no stone unturned, that we have no regrets for what might have been. How do we even know what happiness is? Could we be living our lives under a grand misconception, assuming, for example, that wealth will bring us happiness, or lots of sex, or frequent vacations to the Bahamas, or the Mediterranean, or wherever, with the biggest bank account and grandest home among my contemporaries? These are some of the questions I want to explore with all of you this evening. I'll admit at the outset this isn't an easy task. The problem of happiness has been explored for millennia by virtually every culture in the world, and yet we have not arrived at a universally embraced definition. But everybody has an opinion on the matter and lives their lives according to what they presume happiness is. You could say that each and every one of us has a rough and ready notion of what we aim for in life, what we strive for, what we want to accomplish. The things we set out to achieve presuppose the definition of happiness we adhere to even if we can't articulate precisely what that is. Wouldn't you agree that if my conception of happiness is wrong-headed and completely off the mark, I don't have much of a chance of obtaining it? This implies that we'd better be careful about how each of us defines <coughs> happiness and that we know exactly what it is that we're up to. So my talk tonight is divided into roughly three sections. In the first, I'll explore Plato's conception of happiness and what other Greek philosophers contributed to this question. In the second, I'll examine what Sigmund Freud has to say about the relationship between psychoanalysis and unhappiness. And finally, I'll share some of the observations that Friedrich Nietzsche entertained about how to best live a good life, which is to say, a life that is not a waste of time, but a life that's worth living. I'll close with some remarks about love. Now, the Greeks were obsessed with the quest for happiness and explored how best to obtain it for more than 700 years. Since Plato was the person who got the ball rolling, I'll focus most of my attention on him. Yet Aristotle, the Stoics, the Epicureans, and skeptics all contributed fundamental and lasting observations about how to best obtain this elusive goal. How many of you are familiar with uh, any of the Greek treatments of, of happiness? Aristotle, Plato? Okay, well, you're in for a treat. <laughs> So Plato is by far the most important philosopher in history. Though his many dialogues are devoted to Socrates, Plato's teacher, there's no way of knowing just how much of Plato's thought derives from his mentor and the extent to which Plato simply used Socrates as a proxy for his own ideas. All of his writings were in dialogue form. Many of Plato's dialogues touched on happiness, the three in particular devoted distinct conceptions of it. In the Athenomus, for example, Plato argued that happiness should be equated with wisdom because only the wise person is capable of obtaining it. This doesn't just happen, though the words happen and happiness have the same root. Etymologically, the word happy means luck or chance. But this can be misleading because you have to devote your entire life to obtaining it. In order to be happy, you must also be a good person and live a virtuous life. And this is Plato's take on uh, the wisdom part of happiness. Now, this is uneasy, which is why Plato believed that only the wise are capable of it. Wisdom and virtue, in his philosophy, go together. 
This conception of happiness had a profound effect on Plato's most celebrated student, Aristotle. Though not everybody agrees that virtuous people are necessarily happier than everybody else. Another dialogue devoted to happiness was the Protagoras, where Plato equates happiness with pleasure. Throughout history, this notion of happiness has been by far the most popular. It had an enormous impact on the philosophy of John Stuart Mill, the 19th century British philosopher who promoted utilitarianism, as well as Sigmund Freud. Here, Plato argues that all human beings seek pleasure as a matter of course while avoiding unpleasure or pain. This was the foundation for Freud's pleasure principle, a thesis he rejected later in life. For the most part, Greek philosophers renounced this thesis as too simplistic. Greek scholars today even question Plato's sincerity in offering this set of theory because it's so contrary to his other dialogues. Why he wrote it remains a mystery. But I mention it because most people today tend to reduce happiness to pleasurable experiences. A happy moment. The third dialogue where Plato offers a conception of happiness is the symposium. This is one of Plato's most famous dialogues, and after the Republic, the most important. As some of you may know, this dialogue is devoted to Plato's conception of love in all its complexity. The reason I mention it is because here Plato argues that only love can bring happiness. This is the dialogue where Plato examines the notion of eros, one of several Greek terms for love. In Greek mythology, eros was neither human nor a god, but a daemon spirit, something between mortals and deities. In fact, the most common Greek word for happiness is eudaimonia, which I could write that out for you, which contains the word daemon in the middle of it. Eudaimonia literally means to be with your daemon spirit. If Aphrodite, for example, the goddess of love, wants you to fall in love with someone, she dispatches Eros to shoot you with one of his golden arrows, the primogenitor of the later Cupid that was invented by the Romans. On the other hand, she may also dispatch Eros to deprive you of a love that you already enjoy as punishment for displeasing her. So there's a dark side to Eros. It isn't all lovey-dovey. Keep in mind that Plato's characterization of daemon spirits at the service of gods and goddesses is strictly metaphorical, not literal. Socrates, the principal character of this dialogue, didn't take Greekness all that seriously. He utilizes them as analogous to how love may suddenly appear out of nowhere, as though a mysterious power or agency is orchestrating. It just happens. Plato uses this device to make an important point about the relationship between love and happiness. He suggests that if you wish to achieve eudaimonia, you must first fall in love with yourself as well as with another person, but ultimately with life itself. Plato also says that in order to enjoy <clears throat> happiness, you have to endure hardship. It never comes easily. Plato's most important observation is that if you want to be happy, you must learn how to play the game of life, win or lose, and not play the role of bystander who lets life pass her by. Whether you win or lose this game is the side point. Winning in itself does not ensure happiness, because it's how you play the game where the payoff lies. We'll come back to the relation between love and happiness later. Aristotle also devoted a lot of attention to happiness, especially in his Nicomachean Ethics. As we've seen, some philosophers were convinced that happiness is a matter of fate or luck. 
which is alluded to in Plato's Daemon Spirit. Another view holds that we should equate happiness with pleasure. And others still believe that only the virtuous are capable of achieving happiness. Aristotle synthesized Plato's multifaceted conception of happiness into a formula that has enjoyed the greatest influence by far on contemporary philosophers. He concluded that in order to be happy, you need to be all of the above, virtuous, lucky, and wise. He also agreed that pleasure is a necessary constituent of happiness, but not sufficient for it. But Aristotle's greatest insight into the nature of happiness was to equate it with the state of flourishing, a concept embraced by positive psychology. But what does it mean to flourish? According to Aristotle, it means that your life is a success. Yet most Greek philosophers were looking for ways to become happy that would ensure its longevity. They wanted to make it permanent. This is why so much attention was placed on virtue, because virtue is something that no one can take away from you, except maybe yourself. So if virtue is the key to happiness, once you become virtuous, you will always be happy. Yes? Well, not exactly, according to Aristotle. Every life has peaks and valleys. It flows and ebbs. Nothing remains constant. We live our lives as virtuously as we can, devote ourselves to our ambitions, and if we're lucky, opportunities come our way. The wise person seizes those opportunities when they happen and gives his or her heart to them. This takes courage, perhaps the most important of the Greek virtues. Because when you give your heart to something or someone, you're putting your desire upon the line. And as Plato argues, you're playing the game of life, but you're playing it for keeps. Not everyone is willing to risk failure. And such a person, the contemporary neurotic, has lapsed into becoming a bystander in life, not an actor. But here lies the rub. Just because everything has come together for you, an amazing confluence of all the elements that Aristotle says are necessary for happiness, that doesn't guarantee that it will last forever. We cannot, no matter how virtuous or industrious or daring, inoculate ourselves from disaster, hardship, and failure. This, too, is an aspect of the game of life. But the wise person accepts that the risk is nevertheless worth taking. Even if my life is flourishing, I still need to reconcile myself to the impermanence of circumstance, that I'm always at the mercy of events that I cannot control. This is where fate enters the picture. No matter how virtuous a person you are, bad things happen to good people. You have to accept that a lot of your life also occasions a considerable amount of pain and anguish. As we'll see, suffering is the price of admission that you must pay for even a chance at happiness. And what about those moments when your life is not flourishing? Are you going to let yourself be miserable and so unhappy that you become neurotic and erase all the goodness you enjoy? This is a question that the later Greek philosophers, such as the Stoics, Epicureans, and skeptics, wanted to explore. This is a good time as any to introduce that other Greek word for happiness, ataraxia. So there's two. There's eudaimonia, which, played, uh, which Aristotle really uh, kind of nails better than anyone else in history. And now a new word, ataraxia. This was embraced by these same Hellenistic philosophers, the Stoics and the Skeptics. The literal translation of ataraxia is to be without turmoil, what the Skeptics call a state of unperturbedness. 
Ataraxia is essentially a state of serenity or equanimity in the face of anguish or hardship. It has parallels with the Buddhist concepts of nirvana and satori. The British stiff upper lip epitomizes the Stoic interpretation of ataraxia, which is why Freud suggested that the British have the most refined character of all the European cultures. This is Stoicism in its essence, to not complain when things are not going your way, and to accept this momentary state of affairs graciously and without bitterness. Though the three Hellenistic schools disagreed about the nature of ataraxia and how to obtain it, what they shared in common was the conviction that when eudaimonia is not available, you need to fall back on something that will give you some peace of mind. But how? The Epicureans thought that the best way to circumvent anguish in life is to avoid any undertaking that may result in failure or disappointment. They chose an ascetic life that rejected the kind of ambition that invariably leads to heartbreak, loss, and turmoil. They were minimalist. The Stoics believe we must employ our rationality to guide us through this life's slings and arrows, and not let our feelings get the better of us. They saw ataraxia as a contemplative device that helps us rise above troublesome emotions. They were the first cognitive psychologists. The skeptics adopted a very different conception of ataraxia. They rejected the asceticism of the Epicureans and the rationality of the Stoics and embraced instead the, the, the notion that life is about chance. We cannot control events with our muscles or with our minds, nor can we predict the future. They were called skeptics because they adopted a state of not knowing. Both Wilfred Dion and Sigmund Freud were profoundly influenced by this concept. If life is essentially about chance, the root meaning of the word happy, then we need to learn to take things as they come, the good and the bad, and trust that our lives are perfectly okay as they are so long as we face things with courage. In fact, the skeptics defined ataraxia as a state of open-heartedness, which goes back to Plato's definition of eudaimonia, to be with your daemon spirit, which is love. Now I want to turn to Sigmund Freud to learn how he envisioned a method that was designed to access this very state. Freud's notion of happiness was novel, yet indebted to Plato, Aristotle, and the skeptic tradition. The novelty of Freud's approach to the problem of happiness is epitomized by his famous admonition, quote, much will be gained if we succeed in transforming hysterical misery into common unhappiness. With the mental life that has been restored to health, my patients will be better armed against that unhappiness. Now, why did Freud suggest that the goal of psychoanalysis is to achieve unhappiness instead of happiness? Surely we go into therapy because we're already unhappy and in order to become happy, or at least happier than we were. But no, Freud believed that therapy is about reducing our neuroses. We become neurotic in the first place because it's a form of misery that we ourselves orchestrate, one we can ostensibly, if unconsciously, control. We have more control over our ability to be less neurotic, after all, how else could we change, than we do to become happier. This is why we prefer neurosis to the more helpless form of unhappiness. <coughs> So we substitute one form of suffering for another, which somehow feels less onerous. Though therapy cannot make us happy, it may, like the concept of ataraxia, 
to make the misery of unhappiness easier to take. Only when we've embraced our unhappiness are we in a more viable position to pursue happiness itself. Freud agreed with Aristotle and the skeptics who both believed that happiness is not something we can control or, once we have it, secure. Fate plays a, well, fateful role in how and when we have a chance at happiness. We cannot set out to secure it like building a therapy practice or buying a house. Therapy cannot bring us eudaimonia, but it can help us to achieve ataraxia. Like the skeptics, Freud was convinced that if you want to court eudaimonia, you must first achieve a measure of ataraxia, or at least a working relationship with it. This means learning to embrace the life that you're already living and accept yourself as well as others non judgmentally. How is this possible? The two cardinal principles of psychoanalysis that Freud embraced were free association and neutrality. Free association is the mindset of the patient, whereas neutrality is the mindset of the therapist. What they both share in common is an adoption of a non judgmental attitude that is foreign to the neurotic in us because our neuroses are full of judgments that are persecutory and resentful in nature. When I free associate, I simply share my experiences with my therapist and listen to what I'm saying as though I'm hearing it for the first time. Of course, this is nearly impossible to do because I'm usually too anxious to suspend judgment and I want answers now. Similarly, the therapist listens to what I have to say without judgment or condemnation. In a perfect world, such an attitude becomes contagious. One of the reasons that psychoanalysis takes us such a long time is our stubbornness. We're convinced that if we can get the answers that we crave, then we will have the key to obtaining the happiness we desire. But you can't go out and seek happiness, like a fruit that's ready to pluck from a tree. You have to let it come to you and be ready and willing to take the chance when that happens. I know this sounds like a lot of hooey and way too zen and paradoxical to take seriously, but there is a logic to this thesis if we're open-minded enough to ponder it. Following Plato, Freud believed that our lives are rooted in desire. And the things we desire most of all is love, or eros. But as Plato pointed out, love can make us happy, but it can also make us want to die, or kill, or drive us mad. What Freud calls neurosis. So love puts us in a very vulnerable position. And the neurotic in us avoids pain as a matter of course. Taking a chance at love is the riskiest endeavor any human being can entertain. So we play it safe, hold our desires in check, and try to get others to love us first. This is an addition of narcissism, a fundamental constituent of neurosis. There's no way of exercising willpower to change the state of affairs. We have to sneak up on it, slyly and indirectly. This is the genius of the psychotherapy contract. You enter into a relationship with an expert who is ostensibly going to help you achieve your goals. But the goals we set out to achieve are merely a ploy designed to lure us into a relationship with another human being from whom we also want love. And in a manner of speaking, we do get some love from this relationship, but that isn't what heals us. It simply keeps us interested. Being loved never healed anyone. 
as satisfying an experience as this is. Instead, it's when we come out of the closet of our self-imposed fears and intransigence and begin to give ourselves heart and soul to another human being that we begin to play the game of life that Plato had in mind. Much to our surprise, we begin to love this therapist who says he or she is going to help us. It doesn't really appear to be doing much of anything than just listening. Yes, some of us become exasperated with this arrangement and give up, just as we have with all our previous relationships. But if we're lucky, that word again, we just might hang in there, and without even noticing it happen, find ourselves becoming more and more open-minded and non-judgmental. What happens then? We become more loving creatures and less critical, at least in the context of this peculiar relationship. Does that bring us happiness? According to Freud, no. It simply makes us less neurotic and more willing to take chances. Happiness cannot occur in the context of psychotherapy or psychoanalysis, but it just might occur outside the therapy relationship where there is little recourse in the event that I take a fall, which I will. As Winnicott once observed, when I leave my cozy and relatively safe haven of therapy, I find myself in a world without a safety net, on the high wire of life, where the real game is played, win or lose. What then? For the answer, we must now turn to Nietzsche, who had some very surprising things to tell us about this question. Now Nietzsche came after, uh, before Freud, but I've saved him for last because Freud is a good preparation for what Nietzsche has to say. Their lives uh, briefly overlapped. Nietzsche died in 1900. Freud was born in 1856. So he was 44 when Nietzsche passed away, the same year that Freud published his monumental work, The Interpretation of Dreams. Many have accused Freud of stealing most of his ideas from Nietzsche because they're so similar. But Freud claimed never to have read them. Some of us find this hard to believe. In any case, Nietzsche was the father of both existentialism and postmodernism. He was a rebel and a misfit and never married. Apparently, he died a virgin. He fell madly in love with Lou Andreas Salome, who rejected him. But then everyone was in love with Salome, including Freud, who was her analyst and Wilke. Nietzsche was a loner, suffered terribly from migraine and all manner of psychosomatic illnesses, and went mad 10 years before he died, never to recover. This is hardly the picture of an enlightened human being who has much to tell us about the concept of happiness. This just goes to show how paradoxical life can be. Though dismissed by everyone during his lifetime, Nietzsche is now considered one of the greatest geniuses who ever lived. He was a martyr to his ideas and gave his life to them. So what did he have to say about happiness? Something radical, to be sure. If you're not careful, you may take Nietzsche at his word when he says he rejects the concept of happiness as banal. You'd be better advised to read between the lines. The concept of happiness that Nietzsche rejects is the one embraced by John Stuart Mill, who reduced it to pleasure. Nietzsche was correct in rejecting this. But in its place, he embraces the notion of the good life that is rooted in the philosophies of Plato, Aristotle, and the skeptics, the very same rogues gallery that was embraced by Freud. 
Perhaps the most famous phrase identified with Nietzsche is the will to power. An enigmatic expression that Nietzsche repeated over and over again as the essence of his philosophy. A book of Nietzsche's notes was even posthumously published with that title. It's a phrase that invites misinterpretation. Hitler was so taken with it that he adopted it as the motto for the Third Reich. A famous documentary that Hitler commissioned to celebrate his brand was even titled Triumph of the Will, an obvious homage to Nietzsche. But Nietzsche was no Nazi. He died decades before Hitler rose to power. It was only 11 when Nietzsche passed away. So what does this expression, will to power, mean? No one can say exactly, but I take it to mean desire to passion. So will is desire, power for Nietzsche means passion. He was a very passionate man, and like Freud, put desire at the forefront of the human condition. Another famous expression of his was, God is dead. Though he loathed religion as the opiate of the masses, he held a very special condemnation for the Judeo-Christian tradition. Nietzsche rejected the morality that derived from that tradition, especially the notion of turning the other cheek, and argued instead that each person must choose for herself what her morality should be. If you live your desire, then you must not allow others to decide which desires are acceptable and which are not. Like Freud, Nietzsche believed that conventional society has as its aim to make every one of us ashamed of ourselves and neurotic in order to keep us in line and under control. The weak person resents those who are passionate and will do everything in their power to punish them for it. The title of his most influential book, Beyond Good and Evil, says it all. So what does Nietzsche have to tell us about happiness? One of the underlying themes in all the versions of happiness we've been exploring is that the truly happy person is contented with his or her life. That such a person has found peace of mind in their ataraxia. And that the key to achieving such a condition presupposes a capacity for contemplation. Recall Freud's notion of free association. And that the Greek word ataraxia literally means to be without turmoil. Yet for Nietzsche, turmoil and strife are not emotions to do away with or surmount, but occasion our very experience of happiness itself. He seemed to suggest that if we're not careful, we may lapse into ataraxia so contentedly that we forget all about eudaimonia. We're not put on this earth to live a life of contentment and pleasure. As Jacques Lacan would say, desire is not supposed to bring satisfaction. We desire for the sake of desiring, an open-ended state of vulnerability. This reminds me of William Blake's admonition in his great work, The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, where he says, those who restrain their desire do so because theirs is weak enough to be restrained yeah. until it is only the shadow of desire. Whereas Plato, Freud, and the other Greeks we reviewed would all concur that a precondition for happiness requires considerable effort and pain, none of them would go as far as Nietzsche in this regard. Freud, for example, juxtaposes happiness against unhappiness, lamenting the latter as an unfortunate but realistic aspect of our all-too-human condition. 
interrupted by occasional episodes of eudaimonia, if you're lucky. But Nietzsche says something far more radical. He insists that it's those moments of our greatest strife and difficulty when it may seem that all is lost in our inexact quest for this or that objective that I am happiest. Typical of Nietzsche, he turns everything on its head by suggesting that it's when we are most desperately up against the resistance to our aims that we are living our lives to the fullest. Not those moments when we're relaxing by the fire, gazing at the ocean waves, enjoying the afternoon sun. Those latter moments are not unlike being asleep or in a trance. You might as well be dead. In fact, Nietzsche would suggest you are already dead. You just haven't been buried. You can't help but think of Freud's famous nirvana complex as an apt synonym for this death of desire. When you hear Nietzsche declared, quote, I am bitterly opposed to any teaching that takes as its end a peace, a Sabbath of Sabbaths, that accomplishes nothing more than an increase in suffering. What Nietzsche is offering is a life that is devoted to constant and unadulterated risk. A life dedicated to a kind of greatness, not the greatness of fame and fortune. These goals are too conventional. The greatness Nietzsche has in mind is a project of becoming the person you are, not the person others urge you to be. We're talking about an obstinate refusal to conform to any standard other than the one you yourself design, devoted to the ceaseless call of desire for authenticity. Like Plato, he sees this devotion as nothing more than playing the game of life to the fullest. The higher the stakes, the greater the reward. This is eudaimonia in its essence. Apparently, Nietzsche was no friend of ataraxia. In conclusion, I want to say a brief word about the role of love in all this. Nietzsche doesn't have a lot to say about love, but he has a great deal to say about passion and desire. He fell in love with one woman, and when she rejected him, he gave up on finding a substitute. He apparently never stopped loving her, but he could never have her. I don't think that made him bitter, as it might many of us. His love was for his writing and his ideas. Though ignored in his lifetime, he somehow knew that he would one day become immeasurably famous and that he would have a monumental impact on the world and on history. He certainly has. Like many artists before him, he had to die to be recognized. Was he happy? By his definition, yes. The parallel with Freud is amazing. He too put aside the simpler pleasures of sexual converse with his wife once they had children and devoted all of his libido to his true child, psychoanalysis. Like all parents, the day came when he had to let go of his child and let it find its way in the world, even when he didn't entirely approve of the direction that it was taking. And today, with the exception of Lacan, psychoanalysis has little to say about desire or passion or even happiness. Perhaps it's time we re resurrected this missing legacy. After all, it's been the undercurrent of our civilization for more than 2,000 years. Perhaps there's still time to give it a reply. Thank you.
Authenticity is so huge. Maybe that would be my next book after uh, after the one on happiness. Um, but uh, one of the things I want to say about authenticity is, um, you know, some existentialists equate it with uh, morality, and uh, some feel that it's not directly uh, related to morality, but finding yourself and speaking with your voice. Um, and uh, my view is that uh, in order to be ethical, you first have to become authentic. Um, otherwise, you're just following the ethics of the herd. You know, you're, you're being a parrot to what is uh, conventional and it's not really coming from your heart. And if uh, Nietzsche advocated anything, it was uh, coming from your heart. Now, becoming authentic or being authentic is no guarantee that you're going to use that in an ethical way. Um, we have a narcissist in the White House, for example. Uh, 
that doesn't even know the meaning of ethics. Um, so there is that danger. I don't think, though, that um, the person who's in on nice works is uh, is necessarily an improvement over somebody who's just being an authentic jerk. Um, but then we get into definitions of authenticity, and uh, you know, is being authentic being narcissistic? For example, that that's kind of what you're implying. I think uh, a lot of people, uh, especially Marxists, who condemn the very concept of um, authenticity, uh, accused that as being nothing but a ploy for narcissism, without any social contract, etc. Um, but I um, I think that there's two kinds of narcissism. You know, there's there's the narcissism that is good narcissism, which is what Nietzsche is advocating, and then there's the narcissism that we call a pathology. And the difference between the two is that the genuine narcissist uh, can love, but the pathological narcissist isn't capable of love. And that's a pretty decisive uh, difference between the two. Uh, so uh, I don't think uh, being authentic necessarily condemns you to being a number one person. But you just might be, at your heart, a number one person. So just to follow up on that, I mean, so you're making a distinction between morality as the sort of like ethics of the herd and then ethics. Right, as those kind of principles born out of your heart lived experience that for you you hold dear and allow you to live. Would that be a fair way of putting it? Yeah, I think that nails it. In fact, uh, all those Greeks I was talking about, um, Plato, Aristotle, the Stoics, the Skeptics, and so on, uh, they considered the quest for happiness as what ethics probably is. It, it's living your life as a way that will guarantee that you are a happy person. Uh, a pathological narcissist is incapable of happiness. That's why they're so angry and so selfish and so difficult. Um, so yes, I, I would say that, um, I mean, I'm not, I think morality and ethics really are the same word, but I do know a lot of people make that distinction that morality is, when Nietzsche says beyond good and evil, He's condemning the conventional notion of morality. Um, so you could call ethics as your your personal quest to live the best life that you can. Right, that you can, and in some ways the only way that you could live because of your own experience if you attend to that. Right, and then if you were not to attend to your own experience, and then you fall into the trap of morality. Well, I, I think one of the biggest problems we have with the concept of ethics and morality is that it's, it's rule determined. Um, you know, as a society, we create what we feel are the ethical ways that people should behave and the unethical ways that they should behave. All therapists, of course, have to look at uh, how they're working with their patients. Are they doing this in an ethical or unethical manner? Um, what's left out of this discussion is the role of love. See, I, I think if you're a loving person, you don't want to do harm to people. Uh, if you uh, do harbor uh, harmful uh, thoughts and uh, ideologies and uh, motives, then pretending that you're an ethical person to me is a very um, uh, pathetic alternative. So I don't think you can be ethical in the way we're talking about without being a loving person. Okay, so perhaps this is a good way of leading into the next point I wanted to put on the table, which is, okay, cool. All right, <laughs> so we're gonna go into the ceaseless, attending to the ceaseless call of the desire of our ethnicity. All right. <laughs> How the hell do we do something like that? And what I mean by that is that surely there must be some things 
some fetters or chains that we have to leave behind in order to open up the space and to have a certain wherewithal to be able to continue to do that, you know, tripping all over ourselves, of course, as we try. Um, but that there must be something that allows us to then create the space both within ourselves and in our relationships so as to be able to do that. And I'm wondering if psychoanalysis and psychotherapy establishes or fulfills that particular function. Right? And the reason I say that is because I don't want to fall into this sort of like facile CBT kind of take on things, which is it's just a matter of thinking your way out of it or getting these kind of irrational and erroneous thoughts out of your head, and then you'll be able to just move forward. Right? That there is, to use psychoanalytic terms, there's libidinal investments that keep us, right, from actually attending to that ceaseless call for authenticity. Yeah, I, I think that psychoanalysis and psychotherapies that uh, have a similar depth to them, maybe not CBT, um, are trying to make us more honest people, we're more honest with ourselves. Uh, and we do that by being honest with your therapist. Uh, some people have historically used uh, meditation, other um, disciplines that have a similar goal, I think, to, to look in, inward and try to understand who you are. Um, of course, there's a lot of therapies that don't uh, particularly address that, but I, I think that it's up to us how we want to use our therapy. Uh, whoever the therapist may be. And uh, the better you get to know yourself, I think the better chance you have of accepting yourself and uh, loving yourself. And that's that's very important. So would you consider the actual therapeutic encounter that the crucible that allows you to do that, and hence you then were able to do it outside the therapy room in the rest of your life? which is where it really counts? Well, I think so. I, I think um, uh, the whole therapy contract is you know, set up in such a way to try to make it easier you know, for us to relate to a person uh, without feeling that that person is against me, uh, even though uh, that therapist may say some things that I find painful and uh, uh, I don't want to hear that. You know, it feels like a criticism. Um, but uh, but if you can hang in there and really trust that you're working with somebody that only has the best intentions, I, I think you can use that instrument as a way to uh, have remarkable insights about yourself. Um, I mean, obviously this isn't easy, or everybody would be using therapy in that way. Um, but it does take um, uh, a lifelong uh, commitment, I think. Even after therapy. Right. I mean, the end of therapy with somebody only signals, perhaps, in the best of cases, that one has agreed to take the desire of that onto one's own shoulders and carry it into one's own life. Right? So there's no end of therapy per se. It's just that the onus of it falls differently. Yeah, I mean, I mentioned Winnicott uh, at the end uh, as one example of this uh, observation that therapy is an artificial relationship. Uh, you're paying somebody to uh, accept you and to be nice to you and to really try to help you, no matter how obstinate and difficult you may be to work with. Um, and uh, not all therapists succeed brilliantly at that, but they sure try their best to hang in there and uh, be all things to all people. So um, I think, yeah, I think that that's, uh, that that's where we can get the ball rolling. But it is artificial. And uh, when we leave therapy, we're going to deal with people that are not so benign and forgiving and benevolent. They're just human beings. and. If you upset them, they're going to upset you, and then you have to deal with that in a way that uh, you know, doesn't resort to some kind of aggression. Uh, so that's where the real battleground is. 
I, I don't agree with some of the um, marketing of psychoanalysis that it's in the psychoanalytic relationship that everything happens uh, and that you're fully cooked when you leave and go out into the world. I think it only gives you some tools. Uh, the real battle is waged in real life with other people. That, that, that's where we are healed. That's where we really find love. Not in an artificial relationship. Right. I think it was Alan Watts in Psychotherapy East and West that called psychotherapy a giant scam, <laughs> but a necessary one, mm -hmm. in that it allows that sort of thing. It is artificial, it is contrived, but on purpose. Um, and it does have those kind of effects. It's the best scam we know. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Um, all right. So, I, I do want to throw a bit of a curveball your way. I mean, if you ask me to be the discussant, you know, you get some of that from me. So, um, so I'm going to ask you the Freudian question, um, which is, I mean, if we were all able, perhaps through different practices, be it a psychoanalysis or psychotherapy, other practices that allow us to, again, leave some stuff behind, um, so we can then, again, uh, follow or heed the call of our um, authenticity, not letting anything get in the way. Let's say a whole bunch of us were to do that, or the majority of us were able to do that. Would we be able to live together? And the reason I say that is because what people will oftentimes forget is that Freud's grand question is how do we live together? Right? Um, it was the basic thread running through all his work, which is, in order for us to live together, there is a particular claim on us as people, and we're stripped away, we have to give up a pound of flesh, and towards that castration, which sounds pretty awful, but um, this is why they're used. Um, and that there's a particular claim um, on our sexuality, but that we have to do this in order to be able to live with each other. So one of the things that I've noticed over the years is in hanging out with people who undergone analysis or many years of therapy, there's some real difficulty in just simple socializing. It's like, they, it's like can it actually be together? If everybody's following the, the dictates of their desire, does that undo the basic sort of, you know, as Marcuse would call it, the necessary repression that has to be in place for us to be able to not kill and sexually assault each other, essentially, which is what Freud was referring to. So you're talking about society as a whole? Sure. Well, we, we know, of course, what, what Freud made of this. He had a very... Um, dim view of uh, society. Um, he felt that the whole uh, motive that we set up civilization to create rules that a group of people can live by has one singular aim, and that's to suppress aggression. Uh, you know, otherwise, we're just out there, uh, I suppose the fantasy is that without a civilized culture with all these rules would be at each other's throats. I'm not so sure that's actually the case, um, but let's just say that it is, and uh, which is why Freud also thought that civilization, civilized society makes us neurotic, makes us feel guilty for wanting things that are outside the box. Um, I, um, I don't see it as quite that grim, um, but I do, you know, if you all heard that old adage, uh, child fences make good neighbors. <laughs> I think uh, in any neighborhood, you want to make sure that you are protected by the people that live next door. Uh, and yet, you have these, uh, you know, annual parties, street parties, where you get to know each other and be nice and all that, that's very sweet. Uh, but your real friends are people that you love and that love you. Uh, and uh, maybe a neighbor will be one of those people. Um, 
But I, I think uh, society is a, is a difficult chief, no matter how you cut it, and, and we get into politics. Um, Freud said there were three impossible professions, uh, education, politics, and psychoanalysis. <laughs> um, of course, he was being a little facetious with that, but uh, I don't think it takes a genius to observe that uh, our politics are really a huge problem. Uh, and uh, it's very, very difficult to create a society that is really there for people. Some societies are more successful than others. Um, I think ours is uh, not in the top uh, 20. Um, but, you know, we, we like to think we're the best place on earth, but, uh, but you know, it's... Um, the thing you're into in any society is uh, everybody's different. And those differences create a stew that you have to govern the best way you can. And, uh, and uh, you know, my heart goes out to people that dedicate themselves to a political life and really want to be out there trying to do good on a political scale. Um, but just as far as creating a community, uh, we all want a community. We, we all want to be part of a group of people that we feel a kinship with. Uh, and um, I think that's something that we sometimes find very, very difficult to find. Um, and sometimes it's fleeting. You know, you may be in a community that works brilliantly for a while and then things change. People die. Other people come in. Uh, if there's one constant in life, it's that it's constantly changing. And uh, so uh, I don't think my happiness is dependent on living in a perfect society. Uh, I think I can be okay in an imperfect society and, uh, and choose my friends carefully. So on that, let me lob one more in your direction <laughs> and then we can open it up to everybody else in the room. So there's a lot of talk about entitlement. Right. This narcissistically internally driven set of ideas that somehow we're all almost granted by God. Um, not certain inalienable rights, kind of the sort of thing you might read in the Constitution, but in fact that certain things are owed to me. And the reason I bring this up is because I just personally in my own life, I've noticed more and more people couching um, what they want to do and how they might pursue their own authenticity, to use that word, um, behind the veneer of entitlement, right? And I do think there's a distinction. One thing is to pursue the dictates of one's own desire and authenticity and not ever assume that you're going to get it. Right, and that a fair amount of time you will not get it, but the pursuit itself, which is something that you spoke of at several points in your text, is what really matters. That there's something fulfilling in the actual pursuit. But what would you say to this? This constant sort of, if well, this is owed to me, and if I don't get it, and then somehow you're intruding on my authentic living. I hear this more and more. Well, I, I do love this idea of Taicho's about uh, playing uh, the game of life and uh, just putting your heart out there and doing the best you can to, to be involved. Uh, and that you not be a hermit and a recluse, a bystander. Um, and uh, chances are when you undertake something, you're, you're going to lose more often than you're going to win. And your successes are going to be relative. They're never going to be complete um, and total, and uh, most likely be fleeting. So it's about being involved. I mean, to me, that's the community, is just being involved in the place that you live and, um, and uh, relishing that. It's um, uh, this idea that it's only when we find complete serenity in our lives that we've really achieved the ultimate goal, I think I do agree with Nietzsche that uh, that's nice that we get to sleep sometimes and relax, 
but for the most part, we're, we're living, we're too busy living our life to be checking out all the time. Uh, entitlement, well, that's a, that's a term that comes from narcissism, isn't it? Uh, that uh, people should love me, people should respect me, that people, you know, there's a lot of shoulds in, in entitlement. And uh, I just try to be as non-judgmental as I can and accept people for who they are, including those who are entitled. Um, I don't always succeed at that, as you heard uh, earlier. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, things slip out. But um, um, what do you think about entitlement? It's cheap. Because if you go for something, uh, you also have to sit with the rather large possibility that you simply won't be able to achieve it, right? I mean, I'm a Lacanian, so this whole idea of desiring for the sake of desiring is it, is a uh, you know something pretty basic to the way you know I I set myself up in relation to life, um, but that there's something in the uh, there's some sort of grit. In the actual pursuit of it that really matters and that in fact when you do achieve it even in some small measure there's a moment perhaps flash of perhaps satisfaction that that, that itself is a kind of death right so it's the pursuit that matters but this sense of entitlement is i think not only derivative of narcissism but is derivative of commodity capitalism in the sense that we're supposed to have it all. We're supposed to have it our way, damn it. And then when you don't give it to me the way that I tell you it should be, that you're intruding on my human rights, that to me seems incredibly dangerous, anti-democratic, and makes it exceedingly difficult to actually live in a society with others, you know, hearkening back to Freud's large concern over the years. So. Well, I, I think my... Uh definition of narcissism is uh, a person that wants others to love him or her, but a person who's incapable of giving that very much. So in a way, it becomes a compensation right. for uh, what you're unable to give. And the problem with that is that you just need more and more and more in order to have some feeling that you are in the game which in fact I don't think that you are. So the entitled person kind of epitomizes uh, this very hungry, greedy person that just can't seem to get out. Right, that empty self, right? And I mean, the other thing, and I think you alluded to it in the text, is it is also a cheap trick to get others to like you, so there may be a possibility that you could then like them, mm-hmm. right? As opposed to the other way around, and just because I've heard you speak about this sort of thing in other contexts, is you love freely. You really give, almost in spite of the fact that you might not receive it. But if you do, well, that's a nice arrangement. But you shouldn't go for it for those reasons. So, um, so perhaps it's a good time to open it up to the audience. Um, and I think we can pass around one of these microphones unless there's another microphone floating around. So I'll give you my hand. Thank you for your talk. Um, I'm thinking about the point that was made a little earlier about um, community and politics. And you were saying happiness is possible in an imperfect society. And I'm wondering if this um, ceaseless call for authenticity well, about politics, I feel like when you were mentioning choose your friends wisely and it's an admirable to engage in politics, I feel like it's it's impossible to not be politics. Um, and I'm wondering if it's, you know, a ceaseless call for authenticity privileges people over others. Um, I think, I mean, in our country there are people who are like, ceasing their desires and authenticity in new lives and they're detained or they're incarcerated um, as a result of an unjust society. So I'm just wondering if 
this is for everybody, this, this definition of happiness um, through ceasing authenticity. That makes sense. And then I think about um, this thought that like peace is luxurious and um, without turmoil and kind of like this stagnant, flat image. Um, but I think about people who have lived ceaseless kind of tumultuous lives who for them maybe happiness is peace and quiet and just stability. Um, I'm just wondering if you think it's the same for everyone or is it different for different people depending on privileges? Well, if there's something I think I have learned about happiness, it's that there is so many conceptions of it. And um, all I want to do tonight is just share a few of those. Um, and um, I mean, every religion you know, has its own conception of happiness. Um, there's, um, uh, I mean, there's a long list, you know, somewhere. I wrote once at least 20 different conceptions of, of happiness. They're all uh, legitimate. And uh, and perhaps they all work, you know, for the people that embrace embrace them. Uh, I don't think anybody can really judge another person in whether they uh, are they living a happy life. That's something very personal. Only only you or I can make that that call within ourselves. And uh, if living a contemplative life, uh, given that person's history. And what where they come from, and what they had to struggle with, is is what uh, is most meaningful to them. Then I think that's beautiful. Uh, I would never judge another person for uh, how they define that term. Um, if they're happy, then that's wonderful. And who who can argue with that? You know? And um, and I agree with you that we're all in a political system, and we're all involved in some way or other in that. Um, and um, and yeah, I do admire people that give their lives uh, on the more professional side of politics, you know, seek elective office and really try to make a change. And many of those people are very authentic. Some of them are not. But you know, that's true of every, of every profession. Right. I mean, if I could say something real quick. So I was... Um, so part of the activism on my side is is, is not just prison reform but abolition, and um, and so I've been thinking about this for years. And something that struck me um, was, uh, yeah. So there's a there's a famous analyst in France. Her name is Catherine Milo, and she was a mistress of Jacques Lacan. Um, and she wrote a book that was translated into English just about half a year ago called uh, Life with Lacan. And about two thirds of the way through the book, she details how on a vacation they were taking up in Belgium, um, there was like a reception held for like a famous political prisoner that had finally been released. Um, and everybody was hemming and hawing about, oh, it must have been really horrible in the prisons. Um, and apparently the guy was just like, like his eyes were blazing over there. So people had like, no freaking clue what it was like in there. Lacan's take on it was, oh my God, you are free. And everybody, some people got very angry at Lacan. It's like, how could you say this to this man? Right? And he was afraid you must have been free while you were in prison. And the guy goes, you're the only one who gets it. Okay, well, what's the explanation then? Is that so much has been stripped away, it gets down to the basics, right? I'm almost thinking about what we were talking about. It, things are so stripped away that the most essential aspects of what life is about really comes to the fore. And he was able to leave many things behind and then pursue those things that only mattered to him in the extreme constraints that he was living in, right? 
And so, yeah, for as incredibly odd and weird as it may sound, even in those kinds of situations, there is something about a decision, a surrender, right, that occurs that's mostly unconscious, but conscious at some level, um, that allows one to actually achieve a state of, or maybe not a state of happiness, but to achieve happiness of some sort, even in the most horrific conditions. And you read this about the death camps, you read this in like, you know, horrible experiences that are happening now, um, that people are able to carve out some measure of authenticity and meaning that is truly profound in the midst of the most horrible, you know, um, experiences, which then makes me always think to, well, why the hell, if, you know, most of us have way more than we ever will need, right? <laughs> we can't do something like that, right? So we, we create hindrances and inhibitions and put everything in the way so as to not be happy. Because perhaps the one thing we haven't spoken about yet is that happiness is actually damn scary. It's scary as all hell, for as much as you speak about it, it's actually something that once you actually rock it, you might have an experience of it, um, inevitably brings with it a sense of loss. Like love, to love is to lose. It's not to gain, it's to lose, and to lose continuously. And are you able to sit with that? Um, as opposed to trying to, like some of the Greeks did, and many of us do now, try to somehow solidify it into some permanent position that we can continue forever. That's an obsessive strategy that is bound to fail every time, so. Mm -hmm. There were a couple of people Hi. Um, so I'm, uh, what comes to mind to me, because I love Lacan also, is uh, Joe Sans. You're talking about happiness, you know, and I, of course, we didn't really know what that means, but my understanding is it's like this kind of, um, uh, the satis enjoyment, it means that enjoyment in French, but this kind of enjoyment or satisfaction in um, suffering, kind of, in a way. And so, and I'm finding that, of course, as like as being a therapist in training, like that's sort of what I have to help my, um, my patients do is to, to find the, the ability to be with their suffering. And Jung says that too, and not just Freud, that that's kind of the point of life. Being the suffering. So, um, and to me, as I think about it more, or I've experienced it more over my few years of uh, being a therapist, is it's like um, it's kind of a maturity. It's like a maturing of um, of being in the world, or something like that. So, can you just talk about a little bit about jouissance, How you might see that in terms of happiness? Well, I mean, just. Real quick, um, yeah, jouissance is the word for orgasm in French, right? It also has other connotations. So, but jouissance is the very thing that you put in a way so as to not ever get happiness, mm -hmm. right? And it's not masochism in that one is deriving pleasure um, from pain. That's a different game altogether. Um, it's getting caught in, in many ways, a narcissistic enclosed circuit um, that does not allow for anything else. Um, and it's a way of plugging the lack, the lack being, well, the lack in being, which is what we've been alluding to in many ways in, this, in, in the discussion and the talk. So I think happiness is something very different. Happiness is precisely when one looks squarely at the lack um, and then decides to somehow make it generative as opposed to trying to plug it with something, right? So I think jouissance and happiness are quite different things. Um, I mean, okay, jouissance is also a much more complex idea and phenomena than what I'm putting here, but uh, in terms of original or rendition, of Jewish sciences put together by Lacan, that's it. So it's not what you're aiming for, right? Um, because to use Freud's you know, words, the, organ the orgasm or Jewish science is also the petit mot, 
right? It's a little death, right? And in some ways, it is implicated in the death drive. That's not what we're hoping for. Happiness, I think, works in a different direction. So, just to give it a few words. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think, um, of course, Lacan loved Freud and called himself the only legitimate Freud. Um, and, uh, and this idea of Jewish sons, I think, does come from Freud. Uh, in Freud, as I alluded to earlier, there's two types of suffering. There's the type of suffering that life inflicts on us in uh, pursuing our goals, being disappointed, being frustrated, um, that creates uh, perhaps uh, unhappiness. Um, and then there's another kind of suffering that we invent. And uh, Freud doesn't call it Jewish science, he calls it neurosis. Uh, and that we, uh, we can't tolerate this unhappiness. So we create a scenario, and I agree, it's not about masochism per se. It's, it's substituting one kind of suffering which we cannot control over a different kind of suffering that we can control. Mm -hmm. at, least we, at least we have a hand in it. Because if we didn't, how would, how would therapy change us? You know? I mean, you, you've got to be able to do something about this commitment to your neurosis. Uh, you're the only one who can dig yourself out of it. Uh, nobody else is going to do that for you. No pill is going to do that for you. No drug is going to do that for you. Even ayahuasca is not going to do that for you. <laughs> uh, they give you hints of how life could be, you know, if you got your act together and got lucky. Uh, but uh, so, yeah, somehow we face this other kind of uh, suffering that's more scary. Uh, and um, and then we ease ourselves out of that dependence on Jewish sons, and maybe we begin to embrace the real meaning of suffering. Uh, and, and that can be part of happiness. Mm -hmm. Happiness yeah. is not the absence of suffering, it's suffering in the right way. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's good. Yes. <coughs> Talk to in there. And then, yes, and then Todd. In the context, you said something about the therapy is the best thing that we have but to go with the whole process. So you were talking about the waking up and modeling off the therapist. And I'm wondering if you could say any connections between uh, psychotherapy and the initiation ordeal of the past, how we may be of it and relate. I'm sorry, but is that the relationship between psychotherapy and replacing, in a sense, the initiation process that was a model for the past type of uh, working with individuals. Like a, as an initiation, like from uh, from childhood to adulthood? Yeah, ma major developmental transition um, where the initiation ordeal was something that was definitely uh, available to people. Like a rite of passage. Yeah, rite of passage, yeah. But what, what's the question? Well, how does it, how has psychotherapy picked up from that? Do, do, you, do you see any connection between that? When you, when, it reminded me when you said psychotherapy is the best thing that we have, that it is something, but, it, but it's a different, um, it's uh, um, described differently now in the scientific Western. Mode. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think psychotherapy is a Western invention. Uh, it comes right out of the Greeks. Um, and of course, there's other traditions, uh, Buddhism, Hinduism, I mean, a lot of spiritual traditions and disciplines in Asia that have also attempted this very same project. Of, um, uh, and there are many similarities. Um, uh, I don't think psycho analysis or psychotherapy really comes out of the Asian traditions. Uh, I know Chagam uh, Trungpa, uh, uh, you know, the Tibetan uh, uh, guru who was at Naropa Institute for a number of years, um, was very interested in psychotherapy. 
and uh, and he did create his own version of psychotherapy that he thought was rooted in uh, Buddhism. Um, he called it just Shambhala, and I uh, didn't see that as a religious thing at all. Uh, and I, I think that's very fascinating. So in a way, he was very influenced by the West in bringing some elements of Western psychotherapy into Buddhist practice. Um, but I see the heart and soul of uh, psychoanalysis and the therapies that have been influenced, almost all of them are footnotes of psychoanalysis. Even CBT takes a lot from psychoanalysis. Um, they all have that um, lineage that goes back to the Greek skeptics. Don't judge, just come from the heart. And that's all, I think that's all the psychoanalysis is trying to do, is trying to help us stop being so judgmental and, and uh, picky and critical uh, and angry. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, you know, uh, of course, we all have our histories and uh, Boy, when you look at what some people's histories are, you, you wonder how they got out of it alive. And uh, so it's all relative what we're able to accomplish in psychotherapy or psychoanalysis. Um, some of us are very lucky that we've lived relatively um, good lives. Uh, you know, we all have our complaints. Uh, as a parent, I have to say there's no such thing as being a perfect parent. That's one of the things that you learn when you're a parent. Um, and if you're lucky, it makes you more forgiving about your own parents. Uh, I think forgiveness plays a huge role in both psychoanalysis and the Eastern disciplines. Um, and yet you can't instruct someone to be forgiving. You cannot use the will to be forgiving. You can um, say the words. Uh, but to be truly forgiving is to really uh, do it with heart, you know, for real. How does that happen? I, mean, I don't know about you, I mean, I've, I've had some people that I forgave, and it just happened. You know, I, I woke up one day and I realized I, I didn't have any hard feelings about them anymore. I, I had love. Other people I'm still holding a grudge <laughs> So, uh, but yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, just real quick. I mean, I don't think we should underestimate the utter deliciousness of feeling that you've been wronged. I'm not going to put it out there. Because we're not supposed to say that, right? It's like, oh, we're above that, right? No, it's fucking delicious. Oh, it's so nice. I've been wronged by this person. And then, of course, that connects to all the previous iterations of having been wronged before. <laughs> but I'm saying that's a cheap thrill. I mean, really, it's a cheap thrill. Right? Because there is something different. Um, but if you stay in that, short, in that you know, short circuit, as it were, of I've been wronged, and there's a few songs, right? Um, and uh, nobody understands me, and I keep on being wrong, and you know, it's everybody else, there's nothing about me. I mean, that kind of just nuttiness. I mean, that's neurosis, right? Um, and I, if you notice, I keep on speaking about a closed circuit, because it means that in many ways you de yourself from everybody else. That's, that, that's not living with others, that's just being alone, and hopefully at times together with other people. That's a very different kind of thing. So, um, Tanya? Thank you um, to both of you. And uh, Michael, I've used your work for a lot of my own writings and really appreciate it. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about the relationship of grief to happiness. Um, it occurred to me that I feel happiest when I, you know, even if I'm in a state of grief, at least I feel like I'm evolving somehow, that something is happening, and that seems more meaningful than a state of superficial happiness. And uh, it just made me think that happiness isn't like the ultimate end point, but you know, you might even think about a state of grace or a state of peace that could be beyond happiness. Uh, and 
I think what makes me unhappy is to feel melancholic. I feel like I'm stuck in a, in a repetition. Um, so I just really feel like interested a lot in the nuances of grief lately and how to recognize when you're actually in a repetition cycle of, of kind of getting nowhere with it as opposed to genuinely grieving something. I know this is Freud's in his main papers. Uh, and I wonder if you could speak a little about the, the sort of the feeling tone associated with genuine grief as opposed to the repetition or any thoughts you have on that? Mm -hmm. Well, grieving is uh, what you're experiencing with a loss, isn't it? Is that, is that how you're using it? And uh, I mean, Freud had this, of course, as you know, this wonderful uh, small book of his on mourning and melancholia, where he talks about the difference between uh, melancholia, depression, and grieving. Um, the person who's depressed cannot grieve because they, they cannot accept the loss that you're still holding out for. It. And um, and how do we let go of that? Grieving is very healing. And, uh, and strangely, the neurotic doesn't want you to grieve, doesn't want you to feel sad which is another word for grieving. Uh, I'd rather feel depressed than to feel sad. The sad is really when you're on your knees. You know, you, you can't do anything about it. It's, it's gone. And um, whatever that person or thing is, you're, you're going to miss it. Uh, and it's left this empty space you know, in your heart uh, that you'll live with forever. Um, but I think it's also healing if you can mention it. Uh, but, but there's something obstinate in us that just wants to fight it and wants to be in control, wants to deny, you know, the, the whole lost uh, It's very close to despair. And, uh, and despair was uh, very important to Hegel, uh, where he talks about um, uh, to really experience something, heart and soul, which is not the same as feeling something or thinking something. But those are synonyms that we often have for experiencing. But uh, you can have a thought or an emotion and not really experience that thought or emotion. You're holding it at a distance. And if you're a therapist, of course, you see people doing this all the time. Uh, they're talking about being sad. They're talking about being this or that. But, but they're, they're really not embracing it. They're not giving into it. And Hegel's observation is that to truly give into it is to experience it. And anytime you experience any feeling or thought, it elicits despair because it transforms you. Um, so having lived both in the U.S. and also in South America, I have experience with several different cultures. And the thing that always struck me about being in South America, particularly with traditional cultures, um, and I don't want to do the whole pan all indigenous and traditional cultures are all the same. I think that's actually incredibly imperialist to speak about it in those terms. But a tenuous thread that I've noticed in many traditional cultures that I've engaged with is that there's an enormous space given to grieving at a collective level and getting people out of that, again, closed circuit, this narcissistic sort of like, woe is me, and it is this like melancholia, it's not mourning. Um, and it's like actually pulling people into it. It's like your responsibility for the good of the group to mourn, right? Um, and then, then like a whole sale celebration at a certain point. Not the, I've seen this recently, sadly enough, where somebody passes away, we're gonna do a celebration of life. And you go to the event and everybody's just like holding back their tears, but. I'm going to give a big smile 
because we're celebrating their life. Okay, sure, we are celebrating somebody's life. I get that. But there's going to be a whole wide range of emotions that need to be like offered, metabolized, or worked with. And that you can't just put a happy face on it. There is a sequence of things. You mourn it intensely. There is despair. There's despondency. This thing is lost, and it is lost for good and forever, and it leaves a huge hole in my heart. There's no other way to talk about it, right? Um, and then, what do you make use of in terms of that which has been lost? I think that's key, but you can't put the, what is it, cart before the horse. Like, We're going to celebrate, and everybody goes home and cries on their own. How about we cry together, right? Like, that's actually totally okay. And so I think in many ways you do have the advent, the rise of things like psychotherapy and psychoanalysis, precisely because collectively we've lost the ability to grieve, right? And there's some traditions, there's some looking at you guys, there are some traditions, there's some communities that still have this, oh, they still have this alive, right? These are these collective sort of like rituals and practices that allow us to grieve. And I think for me, one of the greatest tragedies is that we've lost that on a really huge level. So, Danny, uh, uh, who are you calling on? Okay. Thank you. I want to stay on your topic and respect your topic of happiness, and I want to ask you about working with people in extreme states. Um, part because I brought my students and that's what they're very interested in. So I will combine the two. What is the role of happiness in working with people in extreme states? <laughs> <laughs> so by the way, that's the Danny question. <laughs> that always comes at some point. It's a very difficult one. Um, I mean, it's um, mainly because it is such a vulnerable state. Um, and, um, but I do think everybody wants to be happy. And, um, and I think uh, people in extreme states definitely have a shot. And I've seen that myself. Amazing, amazing transformations that people go through. I don't, I don't think, um, a person's diagnosis uh, has anything to do with it. I mean, just it's on the most basic human level. We all want the same thing. We all want to love, and we're all capable of it. So uh, that's the short answer. I don't have any special devices or uh, schemes in terms of how you work with people. I mean, all therapy in my view, is about the relationship and, uh, and the intimacy of the relationship. Um, and that intimacy is, is pretty scary for, for some people. Uh, but uh, it's clear in my mind that everybody who shows up for any kind of therapy wants that that's why they're there. And if you can connect with them and, uh, and find a place in your heart for them, then I think uh, you've got a good shot. Maybe one more question. So um, I'm curious about what you were saying about narcissistic closed circuit versus the quest for authentic self and how those are actually different because they seem like almost similar to me I guess my question is how can the quest for authentic self exist in community with other people and I'm sorry if this was already covered but I'm curious about, like how we do that together did, did it that? Um, well I, I, I don't so I don't really think of authenticity as something that separates you from other people. Um, and I, I don't really think of it as remotely um, narcissistic, really. 
Um, I think that uh, you can't really be with other people if you're not on it. That, that's why I'm here. But we all want to be with other people. We all want to be in community. Uh, and um, I don't think there's much of a chance of having a rich experience with your community if you're not with them. Uh, because um, because you're if you're authentic, you're just being yourself, and nobody's stopping you from being yourself. Uh, sure, you might get some flack about this and that. You are no matter what you do in life. You know, if you live your life trying to please everybody, you're still going to have a bunch of people that hate you for doing that. Um, so you you can't let that get in the way. Uh, but I think it's all about community. Uh, our life is all about being part of the community. In fact, it's kind of a misconception that we're not already part of the community. Um, now, yes, I think that uh, the more uh, we suffer with our baggage, uh, whether you want to call that extreme states, psychotic states, neurotic states, or not use any of those labels, um, the more extreme that suffering is, the more that person is likely to withdraw from the community, uh, just to try to get away from them. And what they discover is that there is no getting away from them. Even street people are part of a community, a very specific community. Uh, none of them are really loners. And uh, they're living on the street because they can't handle living in society, you know, the, the one that we're offering them. Um, but they're in our society and a part of it in a very strange way and, and, and a very sad way. And how we treat them is so sad and tragic. Uh, the, the richest country in the world can't be more loving and generous with the people that lost their money on that. Um, but I, I think uh, authenticity community would go together. No, nobody can really survive alone. Right? Or wants to. I think it has to sense I think it has to do with libidinal investments, right? Narcissism is that there's different uh, definitions for what it is, but I think the one that's the, the, the most original that I think captures the most is that um, all the libidinal investment, instead of being directed outwards to other people, relationships, is all drawn inward, right? Um, and so, and this attests to, for example, people in extreme states or in psychotic states where that's like, like a wholesale drawing in a word of libidinal investments. So it means you're not invested in the world. Um, and so, I mean, I think the way that I um, think about it in, in line with a lot of the radical mental health sort of experiments that occurred here in the late 60s and 70s, like here, like right here in Soma, all places, is give it away. Just give it away. Don't take it for yourself. Just give it away. The thing that you think is most important to you, right, that you think defines you, give that precise thing away. And then that is a form of loving. Um, and, and so instead of always bringing it into yourself, right, you give it away. Now, that's way easier said than done, of course, right? But I think you have to, this is one of the things I was getting to in one of my questions to Michael, is to be able to do something of that sort, you have to go through a process where you are able to let it go so you can give it away. So practices are important. It's not like we all leave here now and it's like, oh, oh, we got it. Just give it away. Yeah, you can do it for about two or three seconds and it's like, okay, where's my head? Right? So I think those aspects have to be worked through. And that's, that's 
fine-grained work that happens in different traditions. Um, I think the ones that you know we're invested in are you know, psychoanalysis and psychotherapy that focus heavily on that, but that, that's what it's about. Working on those kind of things so you can finally give it all away. So um, any last comments before we close the evening? Yeah, I, what was your name? Talia. 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 Yeah, I, um, yeah, in fact, that's really what a group of us are trying to do with our Gnosis uh, Retreat Center, is to create a house where people in extreme states can, can live without treatment, but just with love and acceptance, and uh, to help them find their voice and their own authenticity with a group of people. They're all sharing that. Um, and, um, and that's uh, goes hand in hand. Authentic to me. Yes. Okay, on that note, thank you so much, Michael. Thank, thank you, you to everyone for coming. And again, if you're interested in knowing more about the Nosa Center, um, James Norwood is here. Of course, Michael Guy Thompson can speak about Tanya, it. Tanya, Tanya's over there. Right, Tanya's over there. And do, is there a website they can go to if they want to learn more information? Yes. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, no sister retreat center dot org. No sister retreat center dot org. Or the Facebook no sister retreat center Facebook page. Yes. Oh yes. G N O S I S. Okay. Thank you very much. You All right. You heard the last bit. No means uh, from the heart. So yeah, feel free to have some more drinks and snacks, and so we won't clean up immediately, so feel free to hang out. <laughs>